as as I was kind of saying in my emails, I did not reveal who this is, um, but I am going to reveal who he is right now. Uh, Mr. Michael Drew. What's up, man? Hey, it's good to see you. Good to see you, buddy. Um, so I got connected with Michael uh, through a mutual friend of ours, Garrett Gunderson, who is a New York Times bestselling author, Wall Street you know, Journal bestselling author, now success um, bestselling author. And uh, he was like, hey, you totally have to connect with Michael. He's kind of been the man behind, you know, multiple launches of mine and done a ton of different, um, you know, New York Times bestselling launches, Wall Street Journal launches. And, um, you know, now the Success Magazine launches is kind of another thing that is in his bread and butter corner. And, um, you know, maybe, I don't know what it was, maybe five, six months ago, I kind of did like uh, just a casual chat with Garrett. And then I put it up on my YouTube channel and people really, really seemed to like that. And so what I thought I would do with this and Michael, you know, graciously decided to come on here and share all his insights. Um, because truthfully, you know, not, not everybody who's in the industry wants to necessarily always talk about this kind of stuff. And I just thought this would be super cool for you guys to kind of sit as flies on the wall while I kind of jam with uh, with Michael here and and let you listen to kind of some of the the insights and feedback. Um, and so, you know, if you have questions that pop up along the way, type those in. We can kind of do like a Q&A yeah. towards the end and everything like that. And then, you know, for those of you, of course, that are like really do want to become like, you know, a New York Times bestselling author, success author, all those kind of things. That is something that Michael's team does. Um, but I just thought this would be really insightful and helpful. So first off, welcome, dude. The cool. tech gods were not on our side, but you're here. Uh, you know, uh, what's the saying? Um, to make an error is to be human, to really foul things up takes technology. So, uh, but we, <laughs> we we work through it and we're here. So. Right on, man. Well, I appreciate you being here and I'm glad to have you here. So, um, you know, I'm just going to kind of just flow into this interview style, casual conversation style, because that's, to me, that's always how these things kind of work the best and 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 we're just going to kind of flow with it but like um you know you've been in the publishing industry for how long now it's been a while years. 26 years 26 years yeah and how did you even get your start in it like what what made you go like oh i want to <laughs> jump into this thing you know oh, well uh, a couple of things um to, to note first i'm i'm a high school dropout so there's that but um i started my first business when i was 9 um and right until i was 16 uh my grandfather was the dean of the library science school at Brigham Young University and the National Library Association president. My father was a professor of literature at BYU and my mother was, um, her degree was in um, library science as well. So um, books are are in my blood and, and my family. We would spend every summer growing up, we did, we, were, we were fairly poor. We spent every day at the, at the library. So uh, books is, has always been there. I've also always been a, a an entrepreneurial type. Like I said, I started my own uh, my first business when I was nine and ran it for. What was the business? I have to ask. Cool. Yeah, we. Um, what I did is I I cleaned Brib Brigham Young University student housing. BYU has some very specific rules about uh, through something called the honor code, where um, men and women have to have different dorms and that kind of a thing. There's no cohabitation. Um, and so what I would do is I, I, what I started when I was nine, I would knock on doors and say, Hey, can I clean your house? Can I, you know, do a singing telegram, uh, for what, whatever girl you might like, uh, just a, a number of different things. Um, by the time I was 10, I figured that I could make more money having other kids in the neighborhood work for me. And I would go out and do the selling and then send the kids to go do the cleaning. And so, uh, that was my, my, my first business. And I, I the, the, amount that I believe we generated in that seven years was around $600,000. So it was, a, it was a decent amount of money. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. As a, as a young kid. Yeah. That's incredible. My so, first business was a, uh, was a lawn care business. So I can, I can relate to the the services for sure. That's amazing. Yeah, so dude. I didn't make it, 600 grand though. Definitely not. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I had 20 plus kids working for me at, at times during the year. So it was, it was, uh, I had it systematized and it be, I had actually stopped when I was 16 because I started looking like all of the college kids. So they didn't, I, I had a cute factor when I was younger, like, oh, here's a kid doing this. And yeah. when it was gone, when I looked like them, it, it, it stopped working as well. So, um, so, you know, I've got those two, two backgrounds. Um, I actually started my professional career at a company called Executive Excellence, Mm -hmm. which at the time was a division of the Covey Leadership Center before Franklin and Covey merged. 
And I was there, I sold their magazine and I became the number three salesperson within the organization within about three months. Um, and that's significant only because the number one, two, and then four and five salespeople had been there for like five plus years. And they were just really just renewing old subscriptions that they had put together. And so, um, you know, I, I worked hard and the then the merger between Franklin and Covey happened and the magazine was gifted to the executive editor of the magazine, Ken Shelton, who was the ghostwriter for Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And so Ken came to me and he said, hey, Mike, we publish all these great authors in our magazines. Why don't we start publishing their books? That is a young, naive 19 year old. I'm like, OK, let's do that. Right. And I failed miserably. But um, for that first year, but it was my my opportunity to, to learn the industry. And I worked diligently to learn the industry um, from author acquisition to managing editing and design and production to printing to uh, securing a distributor, um, mm -hmm. which I, we, we could talk about uh, later if you like. But um, I, I worked really hard and impressed some fairly important people in the industry. And, and our uh, distributor was National Book Network and our distributor rep was a, a legend in book publishing. Her name is Miriam Bass, the late Miriam Bass. And she um, uh, she also represented another company out of Austin, Texas called Bard Press, B-A-R-D Press. And Ray Bard um, ha um, had a huge success back in 98 on a book titled Nuts, Southwest Airlines Crazy Recipe for Success. And mm. so he talked to his rep and said, hey, we want to do more books like this. I need to bring in someone to help manage marketing and PR. And she said, hey, there's this young kid in Provo, Utah. Maybe you should consider hiring him. Hiring him. So he interviewed me, hired me. And the first day on the job, uh, Ray Bard said to me, Michael, we publish business authors. What our authors want more than anything else in the world is to be a New York Times bestselling author. What I want you to do is go figure out how the New York Times bestseller list works. And I was, again, 19, 19 and a half, and I'm like, I don't know that I shouldn't ask the questions. So I did. I literally called Walt, the, the, the person at the Wall Street Journal that compiled the list, the person at USA Today that compiled the list, the person at, at Business Week that compiled the list, the person at the New York Times that compiled the list. And I said, what are your standards? What are your rules for, for making the list? And they, in, in their own different ways, they they laughed and said, well, we're not going to tell you, but keep calling back and we can, we can become friends. And so I did. Um, and I started to slowly glean little bits of data information from, from the, the different people. Uh -huh. And um, the first book I worked on for Ray Bard was a book titled Secret Formulas of the Wizard of Ads by Roy H. Williams. Roy is um, a, a legend in advertising. He owns the fourth, fourth largest ad agency in North America for buying radio. Um, and uh, we, we did this promotion for his book based on the information that I had gleaned. And we launched the book to uh, number one on the Wall Street Journal and number three on the New York Times and number three on the Business Week. Uh, so that bestseller. was your first book that, that, that you book. launched that hit New York Times yeah. bestseller status. Yeah. Yeah. And, what, years. and like, what what was that? Like, take, take us back to that time a little bit too. Like first one, I remember like my first book launch obviously was not a New York Times bestselling cool. launch, but I imagine it's still all the stress and pressure and normal feelings that you would have. I, I think you know, it was more, that. and I only have partial data. So I was making a lot of um, guesstimations and running a New York Times campaign is a, is a really large thing. It's not a small campaign. It's These are big campaigns. Yes. So I'd love to go lot. into the nuances there, you know, the kind of the components of that here in a little bit too. So, yeah, yeah. But, but but with that, with, with that, with all of those details, I'm responsible for that. So if it doesn't make the list, that author, in this case, Roy would have spent loads of time, money, and energy to try to put his book on the bestsellers list and it would have been wasted. And so there was a little bit, there's a lot but of- when you sold yeah. this to him, just out of curiosity, cause I'm going to jump in and out like this just for fun. Um, when you, when you guys made this offer to him, had you made a promise that it was going to hit New York times, uh, bestseller, or were you just like, this is the goal, you know? Well, so, so you didn't know how to do it at that point. Right. I, I didn't. And uh, yeah. so it was less me and more Ray Bard. Ray Bard said, Mike, I believe in you go figure it out. Hey, Ray, Mike's going to, if you follow Mike's instructions, your book will make the bestsellers list. So I'm like, I guess I'm hot committed. He puts you on the hot seat. Okay. Got it. On the hot seat. <laughs> and so there's a little, there was a little bit of luck. At, um, what I will say at the time um, in the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list, it, it doesn't exist now, but back then, um, one of the things that was helpful for me was that they actually used to put a, a number um, next. So you, you, you'd have your rank and then the title and next to that, to that, they would have a number next to it. And that number represented the difference of number of books sold below and above it. 
So, so if you knew what they one, don't do that now, they don't do that now. Well, they they they, they, they don't publish yeah. it, but they, they do that. But at the time, if you could figure out what one book sold, you could approximate and figure out what all of the other numbers were. And so, um, I, I don't know why nobody else did that, but I figured that out and and said, okay, well, this then this is the logic that I gave, and I said, now let's figure out how to pre-sell the books based on your platform, Roy, so that we can come up with the volume that we'll then give to the, 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 the various retailers. Now, 26 years ago, the New York Times was a very different uh, list than it is today. Um, yeah. Back then, you only needed a few reporting channels and sales, and that would be sufficient. And Amazon wasn't even in their prime yet. They were, they, they were losing money back then. They were they were an important retailer, but I, I believe that Barnes and Noble and Borders, which was around back then, was still selling more book volume than Amazon, and so um, it was it was it was a little bit different than than it is today. But yeah, there's a lot of there was I was pot committed. I was uh, I had a lot of anxiety. I spent a lot of extra work, um, and what we actually did for the campaign, and this is this is important as a general um, explanation for any campaign that you would would want. Because Roy is the fourth largest uh, buyer of ads in North America, what we did is we mailed a copy, an advanced copy of the book to the general manager of every radio station in the country. They mm -hmm. all knew who Roy was. They were always trying to vie for his customers' money, right, for ads. So they're going to pay attention to uh, pay attention to something coming from Roy. And 26 years ago, we made an offer. Um, if you buy 20 copies of the book from a, re from a specific retailer on a specific day, and run 200 radio ads promoting the book, we're gonna give you a, a 12 tape training library on VHS um, from I guess that's how far, how yeah. long it was, right? Um, not that DVD wasn't that around, but VHS was just as common as, as um, it probably still more common than, than DVD at that point. Yeah. And so um, we had over 850 stations out of about 6,000 that participated in the, off, uh, in, in the offer. Right yeah. now, the, the, the interesting, the, the actual benefit though, wasn't just that we made the list. The reason why I need my clients hire me to run any bestseller campaign is to be able to grow their business, right? It's not about the book, it's about the book's impact on the business. And so with Roy, um, we we took him from charging $5,000 a keynote to 20,000 overnight. Um, right. it, he added in that first year after we made the bestseller list, like eight clients beyond what was projected for his ad agency right and so this is 26 he, years ago so 26 years yeah. Ago, yeah 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 he he did the year before we we put him on the bestseller list he did 46 keynotes at five thousand. he mm -hmm. did 64 the next year after we made the bestseller list like he had a difference of five thousand twenty thousand. you can run the numbers on that it's a pretty significant um impact and, and so I, I began to learn um two things one how to work with the author to leverage their platform to be able to meet the the standards of the New York Times and other lists. And the other was how to do that in a way that actually had a direct um, impact on their business. Because right. like you, you could say, hey, here, Mike, here's a bunch of money. And I could say, cool, I could go hit the standards, but it, it's going to have minimal impact on your business unless you, you're intentionally tying all of the actions and activity and motion back towards whatever your business objective is. Totally. Yeah. No. And I mean, people in my community definitely understand. I talk a lot about that. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, the, these things are connected, right. From book to business, you know, to, um, all those things that happen over there. Okay, cool. So well, let, me, let me, let me back that up with some, some stats. I have 130 new, uh, books I put on the New York times, right. Um, we've sold over 55 million copies, but that, well, that's, Nice. What I, what is really most important to me is that 110 of those clients permanently increase their gross revenue by a million dollars more per year, right? 10 of them increase their gross revenue by 50 million and seven by more than 100 million permanently per year, right? Yeah. I have helped my clients uh, generate uh, over three billion dollars of additional revenue that they wouldn't have had because we did the proper launch of uh, we used the book in, in a proper context um, for the growth of the business. I love that. Yeah, and I mean, and and it's also it makes sense why um, you know those kind like there is certain status and clout that goes along with these lists that are different from you know just Amazon, right? If you're if you're not intentional with doing all those things, and obviously there's a reason why they're 
significant investments for those because there's really high ROI on these things too. So yeah. And I, I think I think what's really important with that, um, I deal with a lot of people who promote the idea of an Amazon bestseller. And I I observe two things. Customers don't care about Amazon bestsellers or Barnes and Noble bestsellers or Books a Million bestsellers. It's it's a retailer. But the other thing is is that we have to remember that a bestseller is, list is not for the author, right? A bestseller list exists for the reader of the publication to be able to help the reader of that publication uh, select what books they're going to read. There were a million seventy six thousand books published by traditional publishers last year hybrid mm -hmm. and traditional publishers. There were 8,000 business books that were published. There were 800 marketing books that were published um, last year. If you are a business owner and you're looking at buying a marketing book, how do you determine I'm going to buy this book over that? Well, one of the standards that we use are bestseller lists. And so if you consider that the objective of the list is to support the reader, and the ancillary benefit to you um, as the author is that you're making the list as an expression of your abil ability to get the book out into the market in a big enough way, then you'll you'll respect what it is. But if you say, I just want to be a bestseller for the sake of being a bestseller, you can do that, but you're not likely going to do the, th the right things in the promotion of the book that are needed for the success of the book. You're just doing it so that you gain status. Um, I, I do have competitors in the industry. They all broke out for me. And many of them have ha have been eviscerated in, in the news because they let their clients literally buy their way onto the list, buy and, and warehouse books. I don't let any of my clients do that. If, if I find a client wants to do that, I fire the client, right? Because- So explain a little bit of what that means for people that might not be familiar with what that is. So, so at the New York Times and all the list, the, um, the core standard is that your book sold more than other books, right? And so- um, the, whatever that volume is. And different retailers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, Hudson's, have their own criteria for reporting books to um, the bestseller list. Not every book that is sold is reported. Not every book that is reported is counted. Not every book that is counted is counted equally, right? And so um, what... It's like, uh, I'm, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. I don't know if you can see I've got the Millennium Falcon on oh, my look at shirt. that. I didn't even notice. I thought it was Dots. Um, I'm a, I'm a big, I'm a big, I'm a big Star Wars fan. Actually, my youngest daughter is five. Her name is Leia Ray. I'm that big of a geek. Um, but regardless of that, um, <laughs> the uh, what happens is um, it's like the Force. Like the Force isn't good. The Force isn't bad. You could use it for good. You could use it for the dark side. But the Force is always looking for for for, for balance. So in marketing. Um, it's a tool. Like you could use information and in, a tool for good or for evil. So if you know the standards that it takes to qualify for a bestseller list, New York Times or any of them, then you can necessarily say, cool, I can take money and throw the money directly at buying the book myself and putting it in my garage or in a warehouse somewhere. But a bestseller list, again, is about the reader. It's supposed to help the reader determine if this is a book that they should read or not. You're buying your own book and putting it in your own garage or, or a warehouse is not reflective of, of consumer sales. That's not right. actually a bestseller. That's yeah. you, buying, you're, you buying your way onto the list. And But there are people who, who know that there is still some intrinsic value saying, I'm a New York Times bestseller or success bestseller or USA Today bestseller, and, and they don't want to put the time, effort, and energy to do the promotion properly. Yeah. Um, so they they buy their way onto the list. And that's unethical. It's not illegal, but it's unethical it's, and immoral. And, and the, my competitors and their clients get caught doing that. I, I've never had a problem with it because on the other side, we actually sell, my clients actually sell all of their books. And the other side of that is if you buy your own book, that's not going to grow your business. When you take the time Obviously, and energy, yeah. energy to yeah. sell the book, there's so much motion going into that, that the activity that you're putting in to sell the book is going to grow your company, regardless of the status. For me, the status is the byproduct of doing the right, uh, the right marketing for the book. And you just happen to make the list as, as a byproduct of doing those things. If you mm -hmm. short circuit that, you you short circuit the value and benefit of the promotion. So yeah, that's that that's our no, no, I, I think uh, I, I think it's super insightful. And I, I think a lot of people don't realize too how how common that is with certain people, you know. Um yeah, for sure. So 
let's let's jump gears. So now, geez, you've done what did you say, 130 plus 130. New York Times bestselling books, which is incredible. Um, and obviously you did Garrett's book. I know you've done, I think you were telling me last time we were talking, you've done like T. Harvecker's book. You did you've done so many people's books that we could you know, quote yeah, unquote, I, name I, drop. Look, but... I mean, it, it, we, we like to joke in, inside the company, if you've bought or sold a house, if you've eaten fast food, uh, if you drink soda, uh, if you've driven a car, you've probably um, uh, purchased a product from one of my clients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, at, at, at billions of dollars in sales, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so let's talk though a little bit about um, kind of the... I guess components overall of like a New York Times uh, best-selling book launch, or or, and and then later on, if you want to explain a little bit how that you know is, is the same or different from the Success uh, Magazine one, that's fine too. But maybe like big picture, okay, like here are kind of like the ways that we look at a launch like this because um, it takes time. This isn't something you're like, hey, let's let's be on the list tomorrow, <laughs> right? There's obviously a lot of forethought, a lot of strategy that goes into it. Uh, there's a, a, a message to market match, right? There's a back end on the business as well. Um, and so I hope you guys, by the way, are just taking notes on this and, and soaking this stuff up because, you know, um, people like Michael don't don't come along all the time and and, and kind of talk about this stuff. So, but anyway, if you could give us kind of the big, like the, the big buckets of like, all right, here are kind of like the overall components of, of one of these launches. So, so what I'll say is that the, the basis of a New York Times campaign or a USA Today and success campaign are going to be the same, yep. right? The, it's about what are we trying to accomplish for your business with the book? So in business, what, what happens is people look at marketing tactically, right? They're like, oh, I, I need to do a book because I, I think it has a tactical benefit. It's going gonna, it's gonna to grow my business in some capacity. And in truth, that, that's not accurate. The way that you build any business is define the outcome. Once you've defined what the outcome is, you you then define how are you measuring that you've accomplished that outcome. Once so give me an example people, of that with one of, one of these book, New York Times book launches. Yeah, so I worked um, with, um, okay, so Roy, I, we talked about Roy Williams earlier. Roy's objective was to be able to increase his speaking fees from $5,000 to $20,000. Uh, dollars. Um, what we knew was that his platform was through relationships at the individual radio station level, right? So if he wanted to increase his speaking fees against other speakers, because there are other people in radio that speak, um, he knew that there was no New York Times bestseller at, that worked exclusively in radio like he did. So he knew that that was the list that we needed to uh, aim for. So what we then did is we we sat down and we said, cool, what are the resources that you have? One of the processes that I take clients through is something that we call circles of influence. Um, Garrett Gunderson would talk about there being three kinds of capital, intellectual capital, relationship capital, and financial capital. Mm -hmm. Well, in a campaign, regardless of which kind of campaign, I always look at the financial capital last because it's the least efficient use of resources. We look at what intellectual capital you have, and we look at what relational capital that you have. So in the case of Roy, we, we knew that radio stations were having, um, with new the internet, new technology, they were starting to have a, a problem selling radio. And and Roy exclusively only uses radio, and he's, you know, I mean, he's really amazing at what he does. And so we said, cool, how do we help the radio station out? while being able to to meet the standards and so what we said is and this is what actually the picture was we, we mailed the, the book out i did the follow-up and i oversaw a sales team um that did the follow-up to the radio stations and what we would say is look what you want to do is get a copy of this book into the hands of potential um clients business owners that could buy radio from you the book argues why radio is the best form of of media for a smaller medium-sized business and and because it's not your book it's it's coming from a third party uh, author. It actually has more credibility with your authors. So what we want you to do is buy the twenty books to give to twenty uh, twenty potential customers, and we're going to give the training to your sales reps on how to use the book to better sell radio. Right. Mm -hmm. So distinctly, this is Roy's platform. Right. We we looked at how do we leverage those relationships in order to be able to generate first the, the original sales, and then of course. We had hundreds of thousands of radio ads nationwide running for the book for about three months, which helped to sell even even more books. But the the objective was to 
look at what Roy wanted, which was increased speaking fees, the, the definition of being a bestseller would accomplish that. And in reality, what happened is at the end of that campaign, um, his business grew so much that he had to buy a, a new facility, a piece of land uh, in um, in Austin that we now call the Wizard Academy, um, where um, he built an entire business communication school around the, the content that he teaches and the work that he does with his clients because he by himself couldn't meet all of the demand. He's got a, a partner group and everything that takes and disseminates his information based on the explosion of uh, of what we did. Another example would let be- me, Let me pause this for one second because I love what you just said. And I want to make sure everybody hears this because what I'm hearing you say is you guys were very strategic and intentional about going like, hey, creating basically a win-win, right? It was like, hey, if we get this book in the hands of our ideal customers, more or less, right? And then they give it to their ideal customers. Now it's making them look good. So they're doing more business and then they'll want to do more business with us. Um, and it's just kind of a domino effect. So I, I love that whole concept of like thinking about how you create win-wins with it, not just, you know, me, the author, becoming a best-selling author and winning, you know, love it. Great concept. So, so, so yeah, go ahead. A couple, a couple of other examples. Um, do you know who Ivan Meisner is? The founder I of don't. BNI? So BNI is the world's largest business referral organization. I know BNI, yeah. Okay, so Ivan was the founder of that, and so when I, he was actually the second author I worked with, and we did a, we we sat down before we even wrote the book, and he said, I want to grow, I want to double the size of BNI in three years using the promotion of the book, and so I said, cool, let's look at the resources and assets that you have. Well, BNI is a franchised organization, and so what we did is we said, you know what? Why don't we not have a book from Ivan? Let's have a book that is written by the franchise owners from BNI, right? And um, let's let's use the book as a lead generation tool to, to drive members into BNI. So, from a, for those of you that don't know BNI, they're the, your Monday morning breakfast group that gets together and they have a what I call a forced referral system. They pick two members of the chapter every week that everybody else has to go get like ten warm leads and they have a definition for what warm means they also only allow one person per industry per chapter so there's never competition within 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 the chapter so the members in a chapter they pay to be there but they have incentive to grow their chapter because it means more referrals for them down the line the franchise owners then go out and set up different chapters and as people come in they they get paid um based on on the membership fees and so what we what we said is let's i don't normally do book signings but i said let's do the world's largest book signing in fact we broke again a world record for this what we did is we took the franchise owners had them contribute to a book titled masters of networking ivan was the primary author but they were all they were all there and we set up a book signing on the same day at the same time in 56 different cities around the country each Man. of those contributors did their own local media that had, that was part of the to be part of the book they had to do a few things they had to buy some books they had to do media and they had to promote the um the the book signing now the book signing um was used as a membership drive so the members of the chapters in the area brought potential members to uh, of, of bni to the book signing right so we pre-sold the BNI members like 10,000 copies. On what we called Master's Day, we sold 17,000 books to people who were not BNI members because the BNI members were, a, um, were bringing in potential members. We, within three months, doubled the size of BNI because of that promotion, right? And okay. we actually did it again on, a, on two other books a couple of years later. Um, we actually won a bunch of marketing awards and whatever else for the, for the campaign. But the objective was cool, we know that the members of BNI benefit from more members. Let's leverage the book and the promotion of the book to be able to put more members into your chapter. Hey, and bring people out and come meet the the uh, the co-author of this best-selling book. And we launched the book uh, to number two on the New York Times and number one on the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list. Number one on Business Week, I think number twenty-six or something on USA Today. So 
right? We, we, we did everything that we needed and it literally doubled the size of, of BNI in a much faster time frame than we ever would have, would have imagined, right? So again, it's- so The first thing is you start with this big outcome, right? Which is like whatever the client's main outcome business-wise is. And then we're crafting the launch around that. That's what I'm hearing you say, correct? Yeah, exactly. It's outcome and then strategy and then tactic, right? It, whether we do a, a book signing is a tactical thing, right? It's not strategic. It's not an outcome. It's a tactical question. Um, we don't define any tactics until we define the strategy. You can't define a strategy until you define what the outcome is and how you're going to measure that, that that's happened. Um, another example would be, I worked on a book um, by John Maxwell. And same, same question I ask everybody, how do we uh, define success? How do we measure it? And he said, um, it, was a little, it was a little more general than normal because he's very successful. He's got all the money he wants. He, his drive is different than a lot of my other clients. And he said, I want to get a million people to tell a story of living a life of significance. Okay. So we had a specific number, a million people telling a story of living a life of, signif of significance. And so what we did, um, and this was a number of years ago when technology was not as easy to use as it is today, is we built a system where he drove his audience into a quiz before quizzes were, were, were popularized that said, what what is your leadership style? He's a leadership uh, expert. Yeah. And um, what 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 is your leadership style? And we married it with his content and Myers Briggs because we wanted to be able to define the Myers Briggs temperament of each of those people. Because what happened is once they once we defined you're this kind of a leader, we then put them into a different um, relationship building funnel based on which which outcome they got. Because speaking to one temperament type over another our needs and language and all of those things are different. And so we, what we then did is we took them from, you're this kind of leader. And we said, would you like to be a better leader? Um, we have a seven day challenge with John. And so what we did is we said, it was a, you, you opted in and we, every day, uh, and um, every day we gave a new action for the, the, the person to take. Uh, John would tell a story and then he'd say, now go buy coffee for the person behind you or go smile at 10 people in a park that you don't know or what, what, whatever it was. There were, there were 10 things and um, or seven, seven different uh, modules. Well, what we actually did is ba based on which leadership type they were, we knew what types of actions would most excite them so that when we got them to take the action that they would have an actual memorable visceral response to it so that they would want to take the next action. And so we, we defined this in a way to make sure that every single day when they took the action that they got a result from taking that action. And it was, it was free. One of the things, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll get back to this. Um, I'll just diatribe a little bit. One of the things that most people think about when selling a book is that the currency that we're asking them to spend is money. In, in business, the currencies that we exchange are time, energy, information, and money. Mm -hmm. When someone is buying a book, the consideration isn't the $24.95 to buy the book. It's the time, the four, six, or eight hours to read the book. I mean, I, I, I won't speak for you, but I, on my shelf, have what I call shelf help. These are books that are just helping the shelf that I've never read, and that they're just sitting there, right? And we all, most of us have shelf help. And so the, the sometimes conscious, sometimes subconscious uh, decision that we're making is, will I not spend the money? Will I spend the time to read the book? So when we look at taking, in this case, um, with, with John Maxwell, taking somebody through a, a an assessment, then into a, a seven day challenge, we ask for a little bit of information, a little bit of time, right? We, we deliver a result that is a really amazing result, then we ask them to spend time and energy in the seven day challenge. We're not, we're not asking for money because we're asking them to spend other currencies other than money, which can be as or more important than the currency of money. And our objective is to take them from spending a micro amount of time with John to being willing to spend eight hours and, and beyond with John, right? That's, that's the journey that we want to take the customers on. Well, and let me so, ask you this with yeah. that challenge. Cause I'm, a geek on challenges and I love them and built a lot of my brand around them. Um, so with this specific one, did you, so just, just so I understand the flow, was the flow to have people go through this challenge before buying the book or was it from the book and then into the challenge before the book? Before the book. Before the book. Okay, cool. So you gave people an experience, right? Yep. And then they start getting invested in these ideas and making 
a time commitment and energy commitment, yep. pre financial commitment for the book. Mm -hmm. Did you notice? I love that. Did you then notice um, an increase in the consumption of the book then on the back? End? Uh, yeah. So, so it, it, interesting. Inter interestingly, a couple of things. Um, when you follow this type of model that I've described, you get less junk email. Most of us, when we opt in for something, we know that we're going to get spammed, right? And so either we immediately opt out or after we get the thing that we wanted, or we have a, a junk email address that we use that we know that all the spams are going to go to that. And we're not going to look at that because we're just going for the thing that we're opting in for. So what we find when we run that this type of campaign is that when you finally ask them for the currency of, of their name and phone number or email address or whatever, if you've already delivered max, uh, maximum value, they we have, a, we have a much higher likelihood of getting their normal email address because we're delivering the value, we're delivering the results in advance of asking. I, I kind of look at it like uh, having- so Where a did you do it? Where, was this a, um, a video challenge that they just showed up on every day? Was it like on YouTube? Was it- a, It was- Because if you're not asking for email, like it obviously wasn't email. You know? It was kind of like a membership. So you would log in every day. You'd get an email and say, hey, today's action's up. You would go watch, you'd log in. You'd watch um, John give his, tell a story and then say, and here's what I learned from the story. And you can learn this too. What I want you to do today is go buy the person behind you um, at, at McDonald's or Starbucks a coffee or whatever, whatever the action was, right? And so he would do that every single day. And then he would say, I want you to come back. And remember the definition and measurement of success was a million people sharing a story of significance. So the encouragement then was come back and share your um, your experience in taking this action. So what happens then is not only are we starting to meet that standard, but because I am now, the, the, the consumer is now taking the action and then they, they are uh, documenting it for the world, it cements the experience in them. It's really easy to to forget little things, but if you if you take have an experience and you write, write write about it, it's going to be more ingrained in in your um, in your brain and in, and in your neurology. And so we were able to do that, and we were able to get daily stories that started to help us towards that million number, right? So what we then did is at the end of the seven day, we said why don't you do a 30 day journey with John and take this experience, turn it into a ritual and a lifetime habit so that you live a life of significance. And basically the 30 day um, journey was the same kind of information that was in the seven day. It was a daily story with a daily action with, the, with the request to go out and document the, um, your, your results from taking that action. And so, um, our, that was our free or paid. It was that was paid. That was that, paid. so that was um, and again there's because of the time commitment. Um, the book was twenty four ninety five. I believe we charged twenty nine ninety five because the other commitments that we were asking were so big that to ask for more money just didn't make sense. Like we we really wanted to be able to, to balance that, and it took us about three years, but we were able to get um, those million stories. And interestingly enough, while that doesn't sound like it's a a profitable action. While this wasn't the original intention, John Maxwell launched his coaching program based on the list that was created for this campaign. And he got over 10,000 coaches for a lot of money to go through that. No, it makes, yeah, to me, it makes dollars. perfect sense because you've given somebody such um, a visceral experience at that level then when they've gone out and done these things activities yep. in the real world and then come back and you know written about them and then there's probably a sense of community built within that as well and then so that of course you're like in love with john maxwell at that point and his work and then you're yeah. like hey by the way do you want me to coach you to do what i do take my money do you want to help other people <laughs> like i help you yeah exactly yeah. it's, it's it, it wasn't a hard thing so when it doesn't matter the size of campaign your times is much bigger than successor usa today but I always look at it from the same context. What is the outcome that we're, we're, we want to create? How do we measure it? Then let's put the strategy together. In John's case, the strategy was this sequence of uh, uh, assessment to free program to paid program. In Ivan's, it was let's leverage the BNI members for their own, for their own um, self interest to help them get more members in their cha chapters. In yeah. Roy's case, it was to be able to help the radio stations sell more radio. Yeah. Right? And so it's it, every client I work with 
has a, a different kind of platform. Now I've done this for 26 years. So there is at this point, a lot of overlap. I can see, oh, well, we, you've got this, like this other client over here. So we could probably pull that idea in and you're, you're dissimilar to this client, but you're also similar to this other client and we can pull this other idea in. So um, there, 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 there are always new components to a, a campaign. Uh, but I've done it enough that that I can see the the the, the similarities now between um, between clients. But it always starts with defining outcome, defining yeah. strategy, and then letting the strategy dictate the tactics, not the tactics dictate the strategy. Totally. Yeah. Do you guys? Hey, by the way, guys, if you're if you're digging this, like, just let me know in the chat because I think this is super cool stuff that Michael's sharing, and especially with. You know, a lot of the conversation around this stuff tends to be like the strategy piece or the tactical piece. And I love that you're starting with the outcomes, you know, um, I, I think it's, it's super, super important to look at these. Well, and I want you to compare if you have, you have what I just described, that's a lot of work, by the way, a lot of work versus somebody who could spend this, could spend money to just pay to hit the standards. It's very clear that all of this work over here is what actually matters. The bestseller list, in fact, is secondary. Like we've always made the list, but if we didn't, we would have accomplished their business outcomes anyway, and they would have yeah. had they they would have been happy, right? But if I make the 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 book a bestseller and they don't accomplish their business outcome, they're not they're likely not going to be satisfied with the work that we're doing. So for me, it's really a business building activity where we leverage a book to be able to open up doors that would, would not otherwise be available. You can't use a book in the same, uh, or you can't use a, a product launch in the same way that you could use a book. Uh, in fact, one of the interesting things that we point out when we do have people who do, do affiliate uh, campaigns is that um, people who have lists who are promoting books um, are far more likely to do the promotion and to do more promotion because their customers don't see the promotion as a promotion, but as a piece of content, because you're talking about the content in and around the book. And so yeah. the attrition rate on those promotions is much lower than it would be selling another product. And it also opens obviously media yeah. doors and other things that wouldn't be available otherwise. I think that's what's so magical about books. And I think one of the reasons why I've been obsessed with them for so long, and I love that, because I mean, essentially it's a product launch, but there is a stigma that is very different, you know, where, if you give somebody a business card, they'll throw it away. If you give somebody a book and they throw it away, well, they're a Nazi, basically. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and so there's a certain stigma with that where, you know, even if you give somebody a login to, you know, a, a course or something, they don't see it in the same vein, even if it's, you know, the similar content so it's given I, I, book, books are magical that way they bypass yeah. the sales resistance on things and um it, it's super cool to hear this stuff um so okay so let me ask you this everybody seems to be really enjoying this as well i'm seeing a bunch a bunch of comments so good stuff what's what's one thing well two questions first one is what's one thing you wish people would ask you about book launches that they don't. I, I think um, the the thing that's hardest for me. I'm a little bit of a, a, a purist because of my my family uh, background. Is the that there's such a focus on the the author and not on the the consumer, the reader, the the end user. And um, I can extract and pull that out from a client and figure out how to d d derive the campaign. But I wish that um, authors would would remember what they're writing the book for, which is not for them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Garrett's got the concept of of sole purpose, which is um, the, that the idea that um, we're all here with a singular purpose um, in serving each other, right? And I, and I, I firmly believe that to be uh, be the case. And a book, well absolutely we want to be able to know that it's going to impact our business it's still not meant for you it's meant for the the reader and too often um authors that i speak with are so so focused on themselves that they lose sight of what they're actually trying to accomplish for their audience mm -hmm. and when you do that it it hurts the the quality of the book it hurts the quality of the messaging it hurts the, the quality of the promotion one of the things that um, I often rail against is the idea that a book is a business card because I don't like reading business cards. I don't know many people that do like reading business cards. And if 
we definitionally say this is a, a business card, we're going to treat it like a business card. And that means that the, the quality of the content isn't going to be right. I, my, the, the, the most enjoyable campaigns like Gary or others are campaigns where we sit down before the book exists, right? And we say, what is the outcome we want to create for the business? What is the outcome we want to create for the customer? And how do we then develop that campaign to be able to create that outcome? Mm -hmm. But it's, it, yes, your goals and values have to meet the goals and values of your customer. You have to have them. You, you, you can't be here and not here and you, you know, accomplish yours and the, and the reader doesn't or vice versa. Um, they, they do have to, to overlap, but um, I am very end user uh, focused and centric in the way that I look at things. I love that. Yeah, no, it's something I harp on a ton. Um, like, especially in the 30 day book writing challenge, it's like, I've, after helping, you know, 12,000 plus people write books now, it's like the shift to the reader is so important because, you know, a lot of people have been told you should write a book or they want to write a book for their business or something like that. But I agree 1 million percent, which is like, this person needs to have an experience on the yep. other side of this. This person needs to have some sort of transformation. And I mean, I've told this story before. I, you, you've you never heard of this before, but I had a really, really low point in my life when I turned 30. I went through a divorce. Um, and I remember being at like, I've never been a depressed person and I was depressed and suicidal. I was like, I, I don't want to live. I was like, just felt so much pain. And my mom gave me this book and you know, the book was called what's so amazing about grace. And it was just all these stories of inspiration. And I'm like, this book, like literally saved me, wow. you know, like it saved my life. Cause I was like having dark, dark thoughts. And I'm like that, that just completely changed how I looked at everything. Cause I was like, on the other side of all of these books, products, anything I'm creating, I'm still like, how does it shift something for them? How can I deconstruct this better? How can I make it more useful for you? Yep. You know, so I, you know, I get a little tingly emotions around those things as you talk about it, but I, I align with it so much because, you know, people are, are buying these things either, you know, especially if it's nonfiction, it's like you're you're usually buying this thing because you're looking for some sort of change, transformation, shift, you know, yep. that might be deeper or less deep, you know, if it's marketing tactics or Facebook ads versus, you know, something like Garrett's latest book with Money Unmasked, where it's a deeper, you know, a deeper consideration. Um, but yeah, dude, I love that. I, I so align with that. Well, and if you think about then from a customer journey standpoint, then it makes it easier to align um, the, the promotion and the marketing of the book. And also then it makes it, in my estimation, easier to tie it back into your business. Because in theory, your business exists to give value to others in whatever your space is. It's about giving value and helping that person out. So if you then look at the totality of the customer journey and the book is one part of that, it's like, cool, the book can't be the end all be all. It can do some things, but if you do it right, if you're thinking about the entirety of the customer journey, then you'll design the book to be able to um, recognize what it can do, can do and what it can't do. And with the yeah. things that it can't do, then it makes it very easy then to be able to lead the, the reader to other bits of content that can accomplish the deeper levels of, of support in ways that a singular, bo singular book could not. But that comes from the thinking through the totality of that customer journey, which starts with outcome, right? And mm -hmm. so to me, that's, it, it's really uh, critical and important to be able to, to, to have that in mind. Totally. Yeah. I love that. Um, okay. So that's the one thing that you wish people would ask you more about or be more focused on. Um, yeah. what is, or are there like in your mind, prerequisites, if somebody's like, you know, it really is a goal of mine to hit one of these lists, of course. Um, but I also have a clear outcome, right? Cause that's the thing that's going to be the primary focus. Um, what would you say to somebody who is, you know, like wants to get prepared for that or wants to move in that direction? So I, I think what, what's important about um, writing books, publishing books, and book promotion is that um, you don't have to do everything with one book. 
some of my clients, their first book out will make a New York Times bestseller. It is very common that an author will do two or three or four or five books before we do a New York Times campaign. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that, um, the again, the New York Times, being a New York Times bestseller is, well, it's a strategic campaign. It's not the, it's, it's not the outcome, but there are specific um, tactical components that have to be met in order to be able to meet that strategic um, outcome. And so what happens is it, for most small to mid-size influencers and thought leaders, um, it, it is often unknown how many, if any of those standards they can currently um, uh, meet. And if they can, or if they can't, do they have the budget to be able to make up, to be able to make up the difference? And so, um, for so me, you kind of have like audience, uh, you, you have like audience size, right. Of, or influence size on one hand. And then obviously there's your economic influence towards these things as well. And what is kind of the, well, and, 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 and business is very like someone like Garrett who runs a financial institution has a lot more money, um, with a smaller audience than, so, than someone like. Um, Ivan Miser, who's got 300,000 members of B, uh, BNI, he's got money, right. but, it, but he's not in the business of money, right? And so um, the, the the resources that are being brought to the table are applied differently against the sound. So I think maybe Makes it sense. might uh, be beneficial for, for the, the audience to maybe define what the standards are so that, that it contextualizes your your uh, the answer to your question. Sure, go ahead. I mean, okay. So... The first thing I want to note is that um, none of the bestseller lists are real bestsellers lists. They're all some variation on a poll, right? Um, some more sophisticated than others, but they're, they're a poll. And in fact, if you go to the New York Times and you go to the bottom of the list and you read what their standards and criteria for making the list are, it literally states that this is an editorial based list. What that means is, and they've been sued before. What this and and they've won. What this means is is that they are not necessarily um, just looking at sales. They are using their own editorial um, standards to include or exclude a book from the list. Um, and in the mid uh, 2010 to 2020s. Um, there and was that's a different lot. from something like Amazon, which is based solely on sales, sales in a period of well, time. Well, they've got some. They've got some other things. Like they, I mean, you you you've got they look at or things primarily. Like, I would yeah. say, yeah, yeah. They, they've got they've got their own standards, but yes, it, it's it's very different. It's not it's not just um, sales. Amazon is sales at within uh, you know some application. Sure. New York Times is not. So what happened is in the mid two thousand uh, teens, um, a bunch of the conservative. Uh, politicians and pundits and media folks were being excluded from the New York Times because they didn't meet their editorial stance. And so they all, um, these people with big platforms, created a big media stir about this fact. Because at, at BookScan um, was launched in 2006, 2007, and um, it's at about 90% now um, in, in terms of comp uh, compiling point of, uh, sales at point of purchase. So it sees most sales. So it, it's it's pretty transparent whether a book based on sales should qualify for the New York Times or not. Like you can see, you, we can see this in BookScan. And so, um, but, and so the conservative folks knew that they were being excluded and it was, and it was clearly because of, of political differences really, uh, although okay. it was, they called it editorial. But because they got so much flack and so much crap from people about it, the New York Times implemented a two-tiered system for qualifying for the list. One is editorial, so if they like you, they'll include you. The other is a a standards-based, where they have five standards that if you meet those standards, they won't exclude your book from the list. Now that doesn't mean that th that you that they may not put your book at a lower number than it should be. There's plenty of conservative people that uh, authors that. Um, the New York Times puts at number 10 that should be at number one, but they're at least not excluding them from the list because they they hit the, the standards to be able to, to qualify for the list. And so um, when I run a campaign, I don't ever base it on the editorial side of it because that's politics and 
that's that's a really hard. Can't really thing. influence it. it, it well, it. someone might be able to, but that's not that's just not my influence. Sure. So for me, we run our campaigns based on hitting the standards. So um, the first standard, and again, the New York Times is using these standards to justify why they're including or excluding a book from their list. So um, the first standard they look at is retail distribution. Do you have enough books on retail shelves against the books that are being sold? Now, most people ask me, why aren't most books being sold at, at Amazon? And the answer to that is no. Now, Amazon is the single biggest retailer in the industry. They represented about 16.6% .6 of sales last year. Barnes & Noble, the number two retailer, represented about 11.1%. So you've got about 50% more sales at Amazon than Barnes & Noble. But that's 27% of the, the whole Total. pie, yeah. right? And so um, we know that that just over 24.5% of books are sold online in any capacity, through Amazon or through any, any other site. That means that all of the other sales are, the books are being sold through some brick and mortar store, Books A Million, Barnes & Noble, Hudson's, Sam's Club, uh, Costco had, was there for a while. They just got rid of their, the book section. Um, the grocery stores, Target, like um, Target's actually making a pretty big play right now on 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 uh, books. But um, hmm. yeah, they're they're they are um, they have the third biggest um, retail online re uh, retailer for book sales. Uh, it wow. goes Am Amazon, Barnes Noble, and Target. Books a million should be three, but they're not. They're the third biggest overall retailer. They sell significantly more at their stores than Target does, but Target's making a pretty big play there. But anyway, um, right, there are all of these brick and mortar stores all over the country. There's 6,000 independent retailers, right? And so um, what the New York Times says is, yeah, we want to see more books on the shelf than book sales being reported. And so what basically, um, what, what normally happens is if a book is a really hot book, you'll, it'll sell 30 to 50% of the books um, that are on, on the shelf. If it's, you know, if there's been, you know, it was after the O.J. Simpson verdict and there was a book about the trial that came out the next day, it might sell at 70 percent. So what what they're looking at is volume of books on the shelf, brick and mortar shelf, not including Amazon and online um, versus the number of sales from those same retailers being reported. And if you have um, too high of sales coming from um, the those retailers against the number of books on the shelf, that that even if you're actually selling the books, they're not going to they're not going to count those sales. Mm -hmm. And so, the first thing that we have to figure the the first standard that we have to figure out to meet is putting books on the shelf. Now, that's the purview of the publisher, whether it's a hybrid or or traditional publisher. You can't do the self publish. It has to either be hybrid publisher, co publisher with a distributor, or a a, a New York publisher or someone distributed by a New York publisher um, to be able to to do this. And so. Um, we have to we have to work with the publisher and or the distributor to convince the retailers to carry large quantities of the book. And for first time authors, this is is particularly difficult because they don't have any. There, there's no history at the retailers for sales for the, those authors. And the, the retailers use three criteria um, to determine how many copies of a book they're going to carry. They they use number one, how well did the author's last book sell at my stores. How well does the average book by this publisher sell at my stores? And the third is how well does the average book in this category sell at my stores? Basically, well, let me I'll... ask you this too. So yeah. typically with these kinds of launches, um, it, it would be a traditionally published book in most um, of the time. I, or, I, have, I, have towards, I have a personal bias towards uh, hybrid publishers. Here's we're about it's about 50 50. It's so about 50. What, what, what it boils down to is the mark the, the marketing is always the, the role and responsibility of the of the author, right? Yep. So no matter publishing model, they have to do the marketing. The question is, can they play the publishing side at the same time? Can they be both um, author and publisher? And to do the publishing side is actually not cheap, right? So um in this case. Um, we want to put at least 20,000 units of the book on the shelf. My next standard is actual sales, and we want to sell 20,000 books. I'm going to use the number 20,000 twice to mean two different things. Books on the shelf versus sales that are being reported to the bestsellers list, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we want 20,000 books on the shelf, and and we know we're, we have to sell 20,000 units to be able to, to make the New York Times list. 
that means that the minimum print run is going to be 40,000 books. And more likely, you don't print the minimum because if the book takes off, the worst thing you, the, the, the best way to have inventory yeah. is to have no inventory. Yeah. And so you're probably going to print like 50,000 or maybe more. So the publisher then is going to spend two to three dollars per unit. So they're going to spend a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars on simply printing the books. Sure. On top of that, what most folks don't realize, maybe your, your folks do, but but what most folks don't realize is that every front list title that is on the retail shelf is paid for by the publisher. It's called co-op. So if it's spine out, it's going to be a dollar per unit. If it's face out in category, it's $2 per unit. If it's on the end cap, it's $3 per unit. If it's on a on the table at the front of the store, it's $4 per unit. If it's point of purchase or special display, it's $5 per unit. That's for the normal stores. You go to Hudson's or Parodies or any of the, the airport stores, it's twice that, right? That's what you pay to buy the shelf space for the book. And you pay that whether you sell one book or you sell all of them. That You're paying the, the retailer the, the cost to do that. So um, if we want to put 20,000 books on the shelf, we're probably going to spend hundred to $150,000 b- between the uh, normal brick and mortar stores and the airport stores to be able to get the, the volume of books we need on the shelf. So mm-hmm. the question um, about traditional versus hybrid publisher is one of, can you swing the marketing hammer? And also, can you swing the publishing hammer? Can you print, pay to print 50,000 books? Can you pay dollars in co-op. Can you cover all of those added expenses? And if you can, hybrid is actually a better way to go. Some of the biggest books I've worked on, um, like The One Thing um, by Gary Keller and Jay Papazan. Great which, book. Really yeah, good book. Love it's that a, book. It's the best-selling business book of the last decade. It was published by Bard Press. Bard Press, which is where I started, is a hybrid publisher. And so they, at Keller Williams, they have the budget and wherewithal where they can do both the marketing and the publishing at the same time. But not all of my clients can have the the, the budget and ability to do both. If right. you can do both, then hybrid, um, the right hybrid publisher um, is a preferable uh, publishing model over traditional because the traditional publishers, they take a, they're, they're taking a risk mitigation approach to publishing, mm-hmm. right? Because well, yeah, again, books, <laughs> yeah, well, books, yeah, well, they're, they're only making money on books, right? They're only making money on books. And what we know is if you put 50,000 books on retail shelves, you could get 50,000 books back, right? There's there's an actual risk to a publisher to do that. And so they mitigate and reduce the number of books that they put on the shelf because they want to reduce their actual risk. Whereas, you know, um, Josh, right, if you if you had a book um, and you, you're going uh, hyper publisher, you could put 100,000 books on the shelf and get 50,000 books back, which would be a terrible return rate, or the normal return rate is 30 or 40%, and still make and still do very, very well for your business because your measurement of success isn't book sales, it's what the book is doing for the business. And selling 50,000 books through retailers should have a very clear, noticeable impact greater than the actual cost of the, the, the publishing expenses themselves. Yeah, but makes to sense. a publisher where they're only making money from the sale of the book, that's a massive loss. Mm-hmm. And so um, we we work with traditional publishers frequently um, with authors because they can't they can't do both. Um, but if you can, my re- recommendation would always be to go hybrid because you have control over everything and you can maximize the the shelf space because your measurement of success is different than what a traditional publisher would have. Got it. Yeah, great, great insights, man. I mean, I want to be respectful of your time too, because um, I know we were supposed to start, you know, an hour and 15 minutes ago. We were a little bit late. Um, I feel like we need like a part two or three or something here for sure, man. This is like, yeah, uh, this is. Well, this I'm, is I'm, happy to go, I'm happy to do another call. We've gone through one of five standards. So <laughs> I know that's where I'm like, man. Uh, and I don't know what your time frame is. I have to, I have to pick up my kids here uh, in a little bit um, in like 20 or 30 minutes, but yeah. Um, yeah, dude, this is this is super insightful. Why don't you go through one more of the one more of the standards, and then I want to make sure you know uh, we have a place for people to like, I, connect. I might be able to go through them pretty quickly because the distribution okay. is actually the most complex of okay. of the standards with the least amount of control. The second standard is sales, so we want twenty thousand sales. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the volume that we need that we split over multiple weeks to be able to qualify. Of the twenty thousand sales, 
10,000 of them must be individual names and addresses. Amazon reports not sales volume, but based on the number of addresses shipped to. So if I ship, um, if I have, if I ship three books to your house, they report one sale. If I ship a book to three people's houses, that counts as three, three different sales. And so Amazon and Barnes and Noble have that standard. The other retailers uh, like Books A Million and Hudson's and, and other retailers, independents, will take bulk orders. So if you're doing it as an example, uh, it's not uncommon for someone who is speaking to say, hey, buy $10,000 worth of books for the event instead of paying me my speaking fee, right? right. So that's a very common thing. And, and so there are retailers that will take those sales and report them. And they're just reporting sales volume, not based on shipping. And so 10,000 must be individual names and addresses. The other 10,000 could either be individual or could be bulk. They have to be real sales. They have to go somewhere other than you. You can't be buying them yourself, but you can make whatever deals with others that, that you want as long as it's going to an end user. The third standard is ebook sales. Now, it used to be that the New York Times had an ebook bestsellers list. And in February of 2017, they got rid of that ebook list. And um, actually, they instituted the majority of the standards that I'm now giving you. These are these are uh, somewhat new since about 2017. Um, and so they got rid of their lit, their ebook list. But what they did is they made ebooks a standard to qualify. So if you don't have enough ebook sales against the number of print sales, then they won't let your book on the list. And so what they're looking for is about 50% of print sales um, for, in ebook sales. So if you sell 20,000 print sales, we need to have 10,000 ebook sales. So that's that. That's the next standard. The the fourth standard, and again, remember these are how the New York Times validates whether or not they're going to include or exclude a book from a list. They're trying to, in their estimation, say this is why a book is selling. They don't understand platform and, and other things, but they think they understand media. So what what they then look for is what's called online social proof. So again, in February of 2017, they launched a spidering technology, not dissimilar to what Google uses for ranking websites. But in this case, they use that spidering technology to validate the amount of conversation about your book online. And so the, while they don't release the number, well, well, I'm happy to, to share, the number uh, that, that the New York Times we know uh, will approve uh, in the standards are 350 blogs talking about the book, 90 podcasts, uh, interviews. Um, in, in the meta tagging, uh, 90 uh, vlog based on meta tagging uh, uh, about the book, Fifth, um, consumer and social media engagement of 50,000 people in Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn each, and then 50,000 engagement in, um, between Instagram and, and Pinterest, right? So that's the online um, standard that I'm you have it. to hit. Yeah. The final standard is legacy media or traditional media. And what they're looking for is to see that your book has been discussed in 100 markets and TV, 100 markets in radio, and 100 markets in print, right? So those are the standards that you have to, to meet in order to qualify. So you can imagine that some authors are able to come in and hit three or four of them and spend, spend budget to hit the fifth. It, it, if you could only hit one of the standards or you can't hit any of the standards, well, then let's not let's not say you're a failure. Let's zigzag our way there. Let's build your platform to where you can more organically and naturally, based on the growth of your platform, hit those standards. Right. Yeah, that makes total sense. Man, that's so insightful. I love that. And um, yeah, we definitely are going to have to do like a, a round two for sure, because there's so much so much good stuff in here. So, um, you know, for, for anybody who is listening to this and those of you guys that are like really serious about this, obviously Michael, super smart, knows all this stuff, <laughs> you know, just like the ins and outs of this and you and your company, obviously you can help people with the New York times bestseller. You are still doing, uh, or the main one is, is the success, uh, list as well. Right. So we and have, then... we have three, we have three uh, campaigns, New York times, uh, USA today and success and success by itself. And Got the it. reason that we, we do use today and success together uh, versus success is that if you if you hit the USA Today standards, you're going to make the success list. Yeah. But um, success has different standards. So it's actually easier um, to make the success list um, than it is to make the USA Today list. And so we have those three different levels of campaigns. And the main difference for the sake of this conversation, I gave you the five standards for the New York Times. Um, the, the, the basic standards for USA Today and success 
is sales volume. They're not looking at distribution. They're not looking at media. They don't have all of those other standards. And so what we're looking at is the number of reporting channels and the volume. USA Today requires like 5,000 sales, New York Times 20. USA Today is like 5,000 sales, success is three. Um, the um, USA Today requires that Amazon be a reporting channel. Success does not, right? So Got it. the ability to make the lists um, vary a, a little bit, but the, still the question boils down to how do we define measure success? And then how do we fit the campaign to be able to make that happen? Well, and I think also, you know, if I'm hearing you right too, because like a big, you know, like the, obviously the, the New York Times bestseller list, they're also looking at, um, or at least the publishers are looking at like past successes, right? It can yeah. also make a lot of sense for people to kind of like stagger those things as well, right? Like, okay, yeah. cool. Have this book focus on success or USA Today yeah. first with a longer goal being like, I want to hit the New York Times, That's but right. I'm going to stagger these things because all those things are going to kind of work in your favor over time. Um, 100%. Yeah, because the, the, look, the, the, the biggest benefit is running the campaign. So if you can't make New York Times, well, let's run a campaign with the objective of success, the easiest list to make, because that's going to grow your company. Now that we've done that and you've got the benefit of that, now let's push it a little bit and try for the USA Today success list. Um, and once we've we've got that result and you've built your business based on that, then let's then let's see if we're ready to do a New York Times or do we need to do another book or two at the USA Today level to build up to to the to do New York Times. So absolutely, I, I I'm a yeah. firm believer. If you if you're building a business and you're, you're 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 using your book to do it, you have an obligation to get your book out, and you should do it in the largest possible way based on um, what your existing platform is. Um, a bestseller campaign, regardless of which one it is, is a precipitatory event that forces you as the business owner to do all of this work within a condensed period of time and th that you wouldn't otherwise be doing it uh, because a book has a, a release date. It has a finite life. Most books have a, a life expectancy of 60 to 90 days. So there's a, a finite amount of time that the book campaign forces you to, to focus on. And by doing that, that's where you're going to see that, that lift and that, that benefit. Totally. Yeah. No, I love it. And I love that you have those different options. Um, and I think it's also helpful, at least for me, I don't know about everybody else, but I'm sure it's helpful too, to kind of see like these different paths that you can take, like if that ends up being a goal, because some people will say like, oh no, I already have like a lot of these things in place and I, and I want to go straight away to like New York times. Others go like, oh, you know what? I'm still building this piece up that, you know, success, um, list would be actually a better first step, you know, towards those kinds of things. So, um, yeah, for sure. Well, um, where, like, if anybody wants me to like connect you directly, like with Michael and you're, you know, you're, you're like serious about this kind of stuff, obviously there's investments to work with him. It's like, <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's a whole business and strategy and all those kinds of things. Um, but I, you know, I think it's awesome what you do. Like, um, you know, it, is it best for people to like email you directly? Do you want me to like connect them with you that way if they're interested? I, in it? I would, like, how, how does that kind of work for you? I guess what I'd say is, I you've got a great relationship with with your audience and customers, and I think it would be great if they connected with you and and you had a conversation with them and and made sure that they were were serious because. The, the 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 truth is these campaigns are a lot of work and time and I want I want to work with someone who's actually serious about building their business in, in a big way, not totally. just someone not just someone who's like yeah hey, it sounds nice I'd like the sash no this is going to be we, you you want to grow your business and you know that that the book is the way to be, to, to do that so um, if you're willing to to talk to them first and and validate that I'm I'd, I'd be more than willing to to take the introduction from you cool. Yeah, totally. And I mean, um, so if, if any of you guys are interested in that, like just reply to any of the emails or send me an email and I can kind of get better sense of, you know, where you're at with, uh, with your book. I mean, obviously these are multi five figuring up investments, uh, you know, to work with Michael on this kind of stuff. Um, but it's, it's super cool to hear like all of the ins and outs and the back end and, you know, how, how this can grow, uh, your business. So, um, I was going to do a and a but I don't think we're going to have time for that today because I want to be respectful of that. But we'll definitely have to do like a round, uh, a round two for sure. Um, anything else, I guess you want to uh, you want to mention or say, but I really I really appreciate you like just being so transparent with this stuff. It's I, I love it. I think it's super Thank cool. You. I, 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 I'd love to come back and do another call. I think Success a Magazine is doing some really amazing things with their list that I, that. Um, they are the new kid on the block, but they're, they're doing some really amazing things that I think people should should know about. Like it's really neat, like book clubs and 
and executive work summaries and doing reviews for all the books that make their list and all sorts of really neat things. So I'd like to come back and talk talk um, about that if, if you're open. Um, yeah, I think, we should totally do that. It'd be fun to dive into the success stuff. Yeah. I'd love, I'd love to do that. I, I think that the, the um, number one thought that I'd like to leave with people is something that Roy H. Williams, the Wizard of Ads, told me like 20 years ago. We were walking um, the streets of New York City after Book Expo America. And he said, Michael, the winners and losers in life are determined when the teams are picked. There are two teams that are essential for your success. The first are the team of people who select you to be, are the people that select you to be on their team. The second are those you select to be on your team. And what I would, uh, what I would, uh, congratulate everybody that they've that that they've chosen you to be on their team and that they that they really are intentional about whatever they do in business to make sure that they're putting the right people on their team. Such good advice. Such good advice. I can't I can't agree with that more. Well, Michael, thank you so much. Um, I again, this has been super super awesome. Um, I'm going to share it with the rest of the list. I'll put it out on on YouTube as well. Um, you know, so it's, cool. it's just been super awesome. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. It's, uh, it's been a real pleasure. Cool. Well, uh, thanks everybody for being here and, um, yeah, Michael, I'll chat with you soon. Cool. Thanks guys. Thanks guys. Bye.